Olivia, congratulations on your excellent film. Thank you. Nobody knows that we are fun. We didn't party because we wanted to focus on school and get into good colleges. And it worked. But the irresponsible people who partied also got into those colleges. We have to go to a party tonight. What? Um, I'm going to ask you a sycophantic question, which is, what's the best compliment you've heard about your movie? That people feel seen. Ooh. Yeah, it really moved me. The, at the premiere of the film, which was at South by Southwest in mm -hmm. Austin, Texas, which is where I intended and hoped we would premiere because I really love the festival, mm -hmm. there was a young woman in the audience who came up to the microphone for the Q&A after the film, and there with 1,100 people in the audience, the first time I had shown it to that many people, she became very emotional and she said, thank you, I feel seen. And she specifically said that she had been the valedictorian in her high school. She had gone up to make the speech at the graduation, mm -hmm. and when she looked out into the crowd, she realized she knew no one. And she realized in that moment she had never felt connected enough to know anyone, yep. and that this movie had brought that all home, and she felt seen. And that continues to happen as we kind of show it to people. For different reasons, people are seeing themselves in different ways, and that, there can't be anything better than that. Okay. Adorable farmer new to the city. No, 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 we don't need characters Hideous because we're not staying. barren orthodontist. Why am I barren? Obviously, it's a comedy. Um, it's not the highest budget. Nope. Nope. Um, in a nutshell, how hard is it to make a movie like this one? It's hard because you have to be so prepared. You need professional, professional actors. Like, yep. we had this incredible cast, many of whom, by the way, technically not professional actors, had never acted before, ever. And yet, we're so professional in their, in their preparedness. Like, I had a rule that I stole from Martin Scorsese when I worked for him, which is, it's not easy to um, obey, but it's a no sides on set rule. There's no scripts on set. You must come off book prepared. You must know this film. And, you know, when you're talking about theater, that's sort of expected, right? It's no big deal. You're off book, you know, a few weeks into rehearsal. Mm -hmm. For films, it's obviously not typically the case. But it allows for creative flexibility mm -hmm. when you don't have much time. And this cast was so excellent. They showed up completely off book and able to kind of come up with brilliant ideas mm -hmm. and have fun. And uh, so because they were so good, we were able to pull it off in a short period of time. 25 days? Basically, yeah, 25. Technically, 25. Would, we had a pre-shoot day, so 26 if you count it. Yeah. Yeah. That's not easy. No. Um, how did it come to you? I hate asking that lazy question, but I do want to know. Like, you're not known for being a director. No. Yet. And now you get a script, which is obviously electric. Mm -hmm. Is it like, mind? <laughs> it's interesting. It was that feeling of mine, I must do this, but it yep. wasn't the script in the form that you now see on the screen. Okay. It was an early incarnation of this idea. And... What it had been was in about 2009, um, two writers, Emily Halpern and Sarah Haskins, had written this script that was on the blacklist, and it was an idea that was unique because it was two very, very funny characters who were women who were very smart and loved each other very intensely. That then didn't make it to production. A few more years went by, and then another writer, Susanna Vogel, came on. She did a pass, and then it didn't make it into production again. But Obviously, this idea was interesting enough that it was something that people kept attempting to make because it obviously was needed in society. But it's almost like society had to catch up with the idea yeah. itself. So then, cut to 2016, I pitched on it and somehow got the gig. I really pitched with a lot of passion because I loved this idea. I had just made music videos, I had made mm. short films, I'd never made a film. But I could see this film in my head and I knew with a rewrite, we could update it to this generation of right now. Mm -hmm. And so we brought on Katie Silberman, who just broke it wide open, reinvented it, and came on and also produced the film. And I'm so grateful because like that, that was what made Booksmart what it became. And you, you mentioned you could see it in your head. Yeah. This is not a movie that is just like, here's a gag, here's a gag, here's no. a gag. There's a lot of visual stuff in here. Yeah. And, and it really, as a film critic, it's really lovely to see a director actively enjoying what they're doing. Yes, oh God, yeah. There are certain shots where I could just feel you going. Yeah, you could see me like, I know. Good. And, but it was interesting, because again, all those shots were only possible because of these amazing actors. Mm. Like for instance, there's a shot where it's a single steady cam shot through a house all the way through an argument. Yeah. And it goes from a swimming pool through a very big house into an argument. 
A, only possible because Chris Harhoff, our Steadicam operator, shot Birdman. So once I knew that, I was like, great, we're going to do lots of like long hallways. Um, then two actors, Beanie Feldstein and Caitlin Deaver, who can handle the extreme kind of emotional acrobatics of a scene, an argument that's very intense, that will be done in one shot. So they have to remain not only you know, knowing their lines and their choices, but completely present. Mm -hmm. And my dream with that was to show people listening, because I think so often, in particularly in argument scenes, mm -hmm. we don't get to see the person hearing the information. No. And it's fascinating to watch someone being hurt, frankly, uh, and seeing how they react in that moment, because it's, it's not often logical. The reaction uh, is something emotional. And for two characters who are so cerebral, it mm. was fascinating to me to see them reacting in a completely emotional way. And it was only possible to do in one shot. Second take, is they nailed it. Wow. Second take. And I was like, this cast is yeah. unreal. How easy would A, B, A, B, A, B, B? It would just exactly. be like, boom, boom, done. Boom. Yeah. Half an hour. Exactly. It was like, take the more difficult route and mm. actually Go for it. I often think about, like, why do we make movies as opposed to documentaries? Why make mm -hmm. a narrative feature? And I think it has to be because you're going to use the tools of cinema mm. to illustrate the human condition in a way that cannot be told through a kind of a literal lens in storytelling. You cannot, you cannot see it. We must show it. We must paint it for you and show it to you. So, for instance, with the, there's a dance fantasy number. This was something that I loved so much because it was a chance to see within the mind and heart of this character who has a very tough exterior. <laughs> it wasn't something I wanted to explain with words. I wanted to show it. And because you're making a movie, you can. So I felt like, okay, I'm directing a movie. I may never get the chance again. I'm going to have fun with this medium. I'm going to use these yep. tools to tell a story. Uh, I mean, you're saying everything I wanted to hear. That's, I, it's that feeling of cinema has the dance sequences. Cinema can yes. have a stop motion pit, you know. Yes. Like, we can do this. We can go underwater. We can see underwater yep. in a way that you technically cannot with the naked human eye, except we can because magical realism is part of this art yep. form. Take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a reason to, to gather people in a dark room mm. and allow them to be hypnotized into this state of, I mean, wonder. And hopefully, it rings true to them and the authenticity and the groundedness of the actual emotions allows them to accept kind of the more bonkers <laughs> journey you take them on. Also, I mean, I'm sure surface level stuff, everyone's talking to you about the soundtrack, but it is, it's just fantastic. If I were a trailer editor, I'd watch this movie and go, oh, I can, <laughs> I can do stuff with that. Oh, look oh. Are we gonna go to school or? Oh. What's two plus two? It was so fun to make this soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I love film soundtracks. That's yep. one of my kind of favorite things about movies. And I grew up listening and re-listening to every great soundtrack, everything from Pulp Fiction to Gross Point Blank. Mm -hmm. to, I mean, there's like, there are so many that I listen to on repeat. And indeed, the movies that inspired this one, you know, things like, um, movies like Fast Times Ridgemont High, Breakfast Club, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, sure. Clueless. These are all movies with iconic soundtracks. So I knew as I was putting the soundtrack together, which was pure wish fulfillment, by the way. I mean, I was like, what if we could get Jurassic 5? What if we could get LCD Sound System? What if we could get Santi Gold? Let's try Salt and Peppa. And because they all kind of liked what we were making, you know, we yeah. couldn't afford any of those people, mm. any of them at their rates. But I wrote them these letters saying, this is the movie we're trying to make. Please be a part of it. Yep. And I acknowledge that that's kind of a great gift from an artist. Mm. I mean, they don't make any money from album sales anymore. So licensing is where artists make their money. And so for them to let us use their music was like an enormous honor. All you need to do is go, Jurassic 5 said yes, so don't be that guy. Exactly, exactly. Um, you shot this this time last year. Um, I'm sure you had key objectives that you wanted to aim for and hit with this movie. Yeah. Do you think you achieved them? How do you feel about the film now that it's coming out? I'm so proud of the film. I'm so proud of it, but you know, it's amazing. The specific chemistry, the kind of chemical reaction that occurs when an audience meets a film mm -hmm. is something you cannot predict. 
But it's, it, it turns the film into an organism entirely different than the one that you had in your edit suite alone. There's something magical that happens when people make a film theirs and they infuse it with all of their hopes and dreams. And, it, and it, it's kind of incredible to be the filmmaker but to stand back and acknowledge like, this now belongs to everyone who watches it. And I, of course, as any director I think does, I see it and I'm like, well, I could have done that better, I could have done that, I could have done that. And it's like really painful to sure. know there are things I had to cut for time that are so brilliant because the actors gave me too much good. <laughs> but I'm really proud of it and I'm, I'm, I'm excited that it's a film that has universal themes so it crosses cultures. I mean, yeah. it's a film that will open around the world and I'm excited to hear from people everywhere. I'm ex excited to get people to see it. It's also ruined the word Barcelona for me. That's good. <laughs> It's gone. Barcelona. 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 <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you like that, then do watch these videos or you can listen to my podcast called Radio One Screen Time. Oh, and do not forget to hit that subscribe button. You can now get more Radio One in your life by downloading the BBC Sounds app or the BBC iPlayer app. Search for full length versions of these interviews by typing in movies with Ali Plum.